Welcome to the screencast for Necessary and Sufficient Conditions by Stephen M. Kahn. In our textbook, you can find that this begins on page 58. So up here I tell you that if you take a moment to reflect on how our human reasoning works, which is what we're going to be doing for this whole section that's subtitled Reasoning, uh, and you start to look for patterns, you can see that one of the most basic ways that human beings reason is causally. So all that means is cause and effect. When we look in the world, when we look at what makes us act the way that we do, we always think that there are causes or reasons for something else happening, either simultaneously or in the future. Remember that when we talk about reasoning in this class, all we mean is we're wondering how one statement can possibly lend evidence to another statement. Or, in other words, how statements are related to one another. So if A happens, then B will also happen. That's the core bit of causal reasoning. If it rains, then I will take my umbrella. If you eat too much, then you will get indigestion. If you want to be happy, then you'll find something meaningful to do in life. Yeah, that one's easy, huh? No, it's different for everybody, but it, it tends to be true for everybody, right? You need to find something that you find meaningful personally, and that will contribute to your happiness. And the reason I put that one in there is because I want you to think about causal reasoning in all sorts of situations, not just the simple ones, like if it rains, I'll take my umbrella, but really complex things that might have dozens or even hundreds of causes or antecedents. That's the fancy logic term for it. Antecedents are similar to causes. Since we use causal reasoning a lot uh, in almost every reason, reasoning process that we use, when we apply it to the world, we'll sometimes make errors. And there are very, very common ones. So one way to prevent or notice those errors is to classify the different types of causal reasoning that we use. And we think, when we think of something A causing B or X causing Y, we want to classify the different types of causes that there are. So when we say necessary conditions, those are the conditions that occur when they must happen for their effect to happen. The way that our author, Stephen Kahn, puts it in the article in the book is, and this is from page 58, one state of affairs A is a necessary condition for another state of affairs B if B cannot occur without A occurring. So B just isn't possible unless A happens. So if A happens, then B can happen or will happen. If a condition is a sufficient condition, when that condition A happens, then B will happen. So it's enough for it to happen if it's a sufficient condition. To hopefully make it clearer, here are some examples. Uh, some examples of necessary conditions are, you need electricity in order to run an appliance. You need a working appliance in order to run an appliance. Here's another one. Being able to get nutrients is necessary for being alive. At least for everything we've known to be alive so far, it is necessary for those beings to get nutrients in order to continue to live. Another example, this one from the book, you must be 18 in order to vote in the United States and you must be a citizen. So these are all necessary conditions. They have to be in place before the other thing can happen. What about sufficient conditions? Sufficient conditions, okay. So spending time with your family might be enough or sufficient to be content. And maybe you had a long illness, so becoming healthy again is sufficient to making you feel content. 
another more factual one. A room that's overcrowded, that's enough, that's a sufficient condition for creating a dangerous environment. But a gas leak could do the same work there. So a gas leak is sufficient to create dangerous conditions. It's pretty straightforward so far. But when they interact people, is when people start making these reasoning errors. And if we have two conditions, there are, of course, four ways in which they can interact. A condition can be necessary and sufficient. A condition or an antecedent might be necessary but not sufficient. A condition might be sufficient but not necessary. And a condition might be neither necessary or sufficient. So here's the first one. Conditions that are necessary and sufficient. So these are usually restricted to logic, math, and the physical sciences. So they're definitions of things. For, so for order for, excuse me, in order for something to count as a member of a group, it must meet these conditions. So necessary and sufficient. And for some, like this, this is an example. For something to count as a circle, it has to have this kind of formula. You can add coefficients to make it a larger or a smaller circle or have its origin point somewhere else, but a circle must have this formula in order to be counted as a circle. This is the definition of a circle. So this definition is both necessary to be a circle and it's sufficient to be a circle. And that goes for a lot of formulas. Uh, gas, uh, pressure and temperature relationship, that counts both as a necessary way to describe it and a sufficient way to describe it. In the real, well, I don't wanna say that math isn't real, it is just as real, but I should say in uh, more experiential cases, we're going to run into the other conditions more often because we don't often think about why something fits into a category or not, at least specifically uh, when we're talking about experience in the world. So let's go back to the appliances example. So you need electricity to run an appliance. So having electricity is necessary, but it's not enough, so it's not sufficient. You also need the appliance itself, and the appliance needs to be in good working order. So maybe all together, those three are necessary and sufficient, but each one is necessary and not sufficient. Similarly, if you're voting, you must be 18, but that's not enough. You also have to be a United States citizen, that's not enough. You also have to register. So taken together, those all could be necessary and sufficient, but each by themselves are necessary but not enough just by themselves to get you to the condition where you can vote. What about sufficient but not necessary? So if your end goal right now in this moment is to be content, there are probably lots of different ways that that can happen, depending on your personal preferences. So some common ones might be spending time with loved ones, eating a good meal, watching a movie, exercising, spending time on a hobby. None of them are necessary for you to be content in this very moment, but each one of them might by itself might be sufficient. So if you go and you watch a movie, you're not doing any of the other things. Maybe you might be spending time with loved ones, but say you go watch a movie by yourself and that might make you content. So it's sufficient. It's enough to bring about the condition that you are content. Okay, so this slide has two different things on it. In the very last case, if a condition is neither necessary or sufficient, then of course, this is the easiest one, I think. It just doesn't have any relationship to the outcome whatsoever. A doesn't cause B at all. A might happen, but it has absolutely nothing to do with B. Okay. So here, 
Here are the critical mix-ups, the errors or the fallacies that we probably have all made at some time and will make again. So as a quote from the book on page 59, the critical mistake is thinking that if A is necessary for B, then A is sufficient for B. Or if A is sufficient for B, then A is necessary for B. These are fallacies. So scenario one, if you mix up um, necessary with sufficient, then you might reason something like this. If you must have a degree to work here, so that's a necessary condition, you have to have a degree. Uh, I have a degree, so you must hire me. And you're mixing it up because just because it's necessary doesn't mean it's enough, doesn't mean it's sufficient. You might also have to have an appropriate degree. You might also have to have a specific skill or maybe um, a second language knowledge. So you, there, for most jobs, there are more than one requirement. Uh, and if you only meet one necessary requirement, that doesn't mean you have sufficient requirements to get the job. Scenario, scenario number two where you convince, uh, excuse me, you confuse necessary and sufficient the other way. So if I said something like this, I'm run into one of those people on the street that are advertising for their candidates on the day of the vote. And this person, say, is a business person or a teacher. And I say, it's enough for me to consider voting for someone if they have five years of prior experience in public office. Your candidate has zero experience in public office, so I will not consider them. So now you're, you're saying that one of your sufficient conditions is uh, five years of public office experience. That's enough for you to start thinking that you might vote for someone. But it might not be necessary, right? So, especially if it's, say, a local school board and someone's a teacher but they've never been uh, in public office, that might be just as good as uh, being elected to some other role or job. So, now you're confusing your sufficient condition with the necessary condition. And there are tons of examples online. If you think in graphs or Venn diagrams, the Wikipedia page will be very helpful to you. Uh, it'll show you the differences of necessary and sufficiency, how they overlap. And I wanted to recommend this website earlier, and I just forgot until now. Uh, Plato.stanford.edu is a very extensive philosophical encyclopedia and it is peer-reviewed. So a lot of times professors and teachers will tell you that Wikipedia is not a good source. And it's not a good source to do research with, but it is a good resource to get uh, a general sense of a topic if you're feeling overwhelmed or confused before you mo move on to more rigorously checked sources. And Plato.Stanford edu is one of those more rigorously uh, checked and vetted sources. It is, it can be a very technical website, but the introductions are often basic and put a problem in a way that is easy to understand.